Well, welcome everyone. Um, what a joy and an honor it is to have Professor Peter Kraft with us this evening to speak on a topic that is extremely dear to Whitworth, that's Christian ecumenism. Before our Provost Vice President, Dr. Gregor Tuswaldner introduces Dr. Crave, I should bri briefly acknowledge the two Whitworth professors who established this annual lecture series, Fenton Duval, who happily was from the history department, and uh, Clarence Simpson, a professor of English. These, th these two very influential teachers at Whitworth co-founded our core curriculum that ushers students through an intellectual diet of classical worldviews, philosophy, and ethics. With degrees from UPenn and Stanford, Simpson and Duval established this lecture series to both nourish our commitment to Christ, but also to confront important issues that Christians, as well as really all intellectuals, encounter when facing challenging and transformative ideas. But uh, to introduce Dr. Kraft is our Provost Vice President, Dr. Gregor Tuswaldner, himself a connoisseur of ideas. So let me also say before uh, Dr. Tuswaldner introduces Dr. Kraft, um, that if you have a question, please uh, leave your question in the chat area. And uh, Dr. Clark, Amanda Clark, will be uh, moderating those. And after Professor Kraft finishes his remarks, then I'll be either, I mean, pr perhaps I'll actually call on you to ask the question live, which I think will be quite nice. Uh, and then Professor Crape will, will be happy to answer questions toward the, toward the very end. So, Dr. Tosvalna. Thank you, Dr. Clark, and welcome to this lecture tonight. It is a real pleasure and an honor for me to introduce to you Dr. Peter Crape from Boston College. Uh, I'd known about Dr. Crape for, for couple of decades now. Um, I started my career at Gordon College on the North Shore of Boston and a friend of mine, a philosophy professor in the philosophy department at Gordon College, studied with a Professor Crave at Boston College. And so he had told me about him, but um, uh, I had actually known about him and read some of his books already at that time, particularly his handbook of apolog apologetics, which came out in the 1990s, um, has been very important for me and my intellectual formation as a Christian and has been so incredibly helpful. Dr. Kraft has written a ton of books and uh, it's really amazing to see the number of books that he has produced. He is so prolific and has written on so many different topics, including C.S. Lewis, has written on apologetics, as I've mentioned, um, which means to, you know, to, about arguments for the Christian faith. And he's written also books on virtues and many other topics. He has taught at, uh, he has been teaching at Boston College uh, for quite some time. He started teaching there in 1965, and he's still teaching there. And um, he is, uh, if you're not familiar with Professor Kraft, I'm so glad you're here. So you will get a taste of, of this uh, unbelievable intellect, of his uh, intellect and um, understanding of culture, of uh, ecumenicism, of our Christian um, world and Christianity in general. And I wanted to briefly read a quote from him, um, and which says the following. Our culture has filled our heads, but emptied our hearts, stuffed our wallets, but starved our wonder. It has fed our thirst for facts, but not for meaning or mystery. It produces, quote unquote, nice people, but not heroes. End of quote. And hero is a very interesting word. And to me, you know, I don't have a whole lot of heroes in my life, but I would count Professor Kraft as one of my uh, Christian intellectual heroes um, because uh, there's so much I have learned from him in his, from his books. And I'm so excited uh, that he is here, at least virtually in this pandemic here at Whitworth. And I'm excited that he's going to talk about the past, present, and future of ecumenicism. So, Give a round of applause, a virtual applause to Professor Kraft.
<clears throat> Thank you. I guess that uh, introduction is over. I like short introductions. You can't live up to long ones. My favorite one is uh, the one where the Johnny Carson introduced the show by simply, here's Johnny. Uh, no, ignore the introduction, even though uh, some, some sort of authority. Past, present, and future of ecumenism. That's a challenging topic, especially in 45 minutes. Uh, I like that. I like it when you do half my work for me. Half the work is getting the question out. The other half is getting the answer out. Students are surprised at uh, the fact that uh, there are answers all around. We're confused with too many answers, not too few. Uh, and they're even more surprised by how hard it is to really get a question out, to really passionately ask a question with your heart and your head together. Uh, and if you do, you'll find something. Uh, when our Lord promised us, seek and you shall find, all who seek find, uh, he wasn't obviously talking about the lottery or even a comfortable life, but he was talking about God and the things of God, which are mainly truth and goodness and beauty. So all who sincerely seek the truth with their heart are guaranteed to find it, at least in the next world, and usually quite a bit of it in this. So, uh, three points, the past, the present, and the future of ecumenism. The very first thing to note about ecumenism is that it is a response to a need, namely uh, schism, uh, divisions in the body of Christ. Uh, you don't need doctors if uh, there's no such thing as a disease. Uh, and this disease started very, very early. We see it as early as, well, the Gospels, but we certainly see it in the early church. For instance, if you read the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, you'll find that uh, uh, visions in the church go back to the beginning and that he has zero tolerance Here, Corinthians 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no dissensions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brethren. What I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Yes and no. Christ, of course, is not really divided, yet he seems to be. Uh, Protestants, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Anglicans, Pentecostals, uh, there are presently, according to the statistics, over 30,000 different distinctive Christian churches and denominations. Always there's dissension. We're fallen, foolish creatures. Always there are going to be mistakes, some of them honest, some of them dishonest. Always there are heresies. The word heresy has a, a lousy meaning today, but it's a perfectly good word. It means, it means grasping for your own what is not your own. It's a kind of theft, kind of intellectual theft. If there is such a thing as divine revelation, uh, then heresy would be to deny or radically misunderstand divine revelation. Of course, we expect to misunderstand things. We don't expect God to misunderstand things. And when he says something quite clearly and we dissent, uh, we're guaranteed to be wrong. Uh, so I don't think there's any such thing as an ongoing, lasting, totally honest heresy. I think at the root of all heresies, there's at least some sort of intellectual sin, some sort of pride, some sort of demand to, to edit what, what God gives to us. As if uh, we're not supposed to be just mail carriers, but uh, editors and, and correctors of the Almighty. And that sin of pride is almost always on both sides. It's like a virus, it, it spreads very quickly. Well, I think there have been three major splits in the history of the Christian church. And the first one was Arianism. For well over a century, uh, the majority of Christians throughout the world were heretics. They denied the divinity of Christ. 
uh, that was probably the, the most serious and the most lasting heresy. Uh, it was conquered. Uh, and then in 1054, we had uh, the great schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, uh, which was largely political. Even the theological aspect of it, namely, do you add que to filio in the creed or do you not? Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Son and the Father together or simply from the Father? Uh, that's a theological issue, but the main reason the Eastern Church protested against it is that the Western Church added it without consultation from the East. Uh, there have been many attempts at healing this schism. Some of them were quite successful temporarily uh, in the uh, 16th century, for instance. Yet the Eastern and the Western Church uh, have maintained the same creeds and the same sacraments and the same authority and the same scriptures. So that division was not the most serious, uh, nothing like Arianism. And then in 1517, we have the Reformation, which began as an attempt to purify and reform the church and uh, became uh, the over 30,000 different denominations. Uh, the results of that schism uh, are far more intractable than the one in 1054. Uh, to get 30,000 different people to agree is much more difficult than to get two people to agree, but we still haven't done either of them. And in the 20th century, and somewhat a few centuries before it, and today in the 21st century, the major new heresy, according to all the polls, is that most Christians don't even believe in the supernatural. Uh, modernism, naturalism, humanism, uh, the denial of miracles, the denial of the supernatural aspects of Christianity, that's enormously popular. Christian morality is still very popular. Uh, and uh, to say that uh, uh, you're a follower of Christ is still very popular, but uh, to affirm that you believe literally in the Trinity and in the incarnation and in the divinity of Christ and in the resurrection and in miracles, uh, that's no longer popular. Uh, and the main reason, according to the media anyway, that uh, it has been unpopular for centuries is in, in a single word, science. You trace the decline of religion in the last few centuries and the rise of science, and you see a kind of X. One bar goes up, the other bar goes down, and it looks as if there's a connection because the more one bar goes up, the other bar goes down. Uh, I maintain that this is one of the great big lies of intellectual history. The so-called war between science and religion is a fake war because it doesn't have any casualties. Uh, I challenge people who talk about the war between science and religion to produce for me a single doctrine of a single Western religion, uh, correctly understood, that has been refuted by a single discovery of a single scientist or a single science at any time in the history of the world. And nobody's ever answered that. Uh, probably the most popular heresy today is what you might call the new Arianism. Uh, Jesus as the nice guy, Jesus as the super social worker. All right, that's a very brief account of uh, the history of schism. And as long as there is schism, there's an attempt to bring the sides together. So. As soon as there are diseases, there are doctors. As soon as there's schism, there are ecumenists. And they've not been completely successful. The church is still visibly split. Well, when we come to the present, we find two things. One, that people care much more about this issue today than they ever did in the past. That the ecumenical movement in all the churches uh, has progressed remarkably in the 20th century that the passionate desire for reunion and the uh, pursuit of reunion uh, is definitely progressing. That's optimistic. 
together with ecumenism, which is an in-house Christian issue, that is reunion of the different Christian churches and denominations, we also find uh, a lot more interest in what's called interfaith dialogue, that is dialogue between different religions, between Christianity and other religions, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, etc. And that too has progressed very remarkably. I'm not saying it's all accurate or, or theologically orthodox. Uh, very often, uh, unity is desired at the expense of truth. And if religion is in the truth business, that can't be compromised. Nevertheless, the desire for at least mutual understanding and coexistence uh, is extremely popular today. The single most important non-Christian religion that Christianity must reconcile with and has remarkably reconciled with, of course, is Judaism. We learned who God is from the Jews. They are our fathers in the faith. Pius the Twelfth uh, said uh, explicitly that uh, all Christians are Semites, spiritual. And there has been remarkable progress here too. For almost 19 centuries, Jews and Christians have hated, feared, and persecuted each other. Uh, not only is that ending, but uh, the first time since the first generation of Christians we find that almost all Jews who become Christians now say that they have not become Gentiles or embraced another religion. They have been fulfilled as Jews in accepting Christ as their Messiah. In that sense, uh, Messianic Judaism and Christianity are identical. Although obviously other Jews radically disagree. We also see the rise of Islam in the last few generations onto the world scene. And that's a, uh, uh, a mixed bag. There's some good news and bad news there. Uh, the origin of Islam uh, through Muhammad uh, is also like a mixed bag because Muhammad arose because of his protest against what he saw around him in all the Arab tribes, namely rank idolatry and uh, polytheism on the one hand, and great immorality on the other hand. And his reforms, uh, like Luther's and Calvin's, were genuine reforms and uh, purifications. Uh, yet Islam spread largely by the sword and by force and by fear and by persecution. Uh, and most of the time, quite in opposition to Jews and Christians, even though the Quran calls them people of the book and even goes so far as to call them true Muslims, that is true surrenderers to the true God. Uh, the origin of Islam, of Islam is to my mind rather mysterious because on the one hand, Muhammad looks like a prophet. He makes the same kind of claims that the prophet makes. Uh, on the other hand, there are real contradictions, non-negotiable contradictions between uh, what the Quran says about Christianity, uh, and to a certain extent Judaism too, on the one hand, and the Bible on the other hand. So did this religion come from God, or did it come from the devil, or did it come simply from human reason? Uh, probably all three. Uh, usually when the question is, is it A, B, or C, uh, there's some evidence for, for all of them. Uh, throughout the history of Islam, there have been times of mutual warfare uh, and times of genuine cooperation. Uh, so that's also a mixed bag. But in the 20th century, we find uh, great ecumenists, great Christian ecumenists rising uh, in dialogue with Islam as well, uh, notably Charles Malik was one of the main authors of the best thing the United Nations ever did, namely the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He was the president of Lebanon, the secretary and general of the United Nations. And if you want to see a very intelligent Christian attitude towards Islam, uh, he was the founder and commentator 
uh, on uh, two dozen papers on that issue uh, written by Christian and Muslim theologians at a conference. Uh, it's a model of uh, uh, ecumenical dialogue, listening honestly without any compromising of truth. And uh, when the uh, United Nations was about to impose abortion as a fundamental human right on all the countries of the world, the cooperation between the West and, uh, and Muslim nations stopped it at the Cairo conference, which I think was a more important uh, victory even than uh, the victory over Islam at Lepanto. So mixed bag there too. The president is confused. And if you're not confused, there's something wrong with you. So uh, the most interesting uh, three points is, is the future. What is the future of a humanism? And the one thing that I'm quite sure of about the future of a humanism is that it is in your hands. That's why you're here. You're interested, you care. Some of you are Catholics, some of you are Protestant. All right, if you're Catholics, listen to Pope John Paul II. Read his encyclical Ut Unum Tint, that they may all be one. It's the most ecumenical thing uh, any Catholic has said in history. And are you Protestant? All right, then listen to your own founders. Listen to Luther, listen to Calvin. They did not want to refound the church and make new churches. They wanted to reform it. They were not progressives. No prophet is a progressive. All the prophets are traditionalists. They call us back to our origins. The fundamental issue, I think, between Catholics and Protestants is uh, are all the Catholic doctrines that Protestants object to leaves or barnacles? Leaves grow from within as part of the tree. Barnacles are alien growths that attach themselves to the bottom of a boat, and if you don't scrape them off, uh, the boat will sink. So, Catholics believe that uh, all the things that uh, Catholics believe are from Christ and the apostles from the beginning, developing gradually, like leaves on a tree. Protestants believe that many of them, the ones that are not explicitly found in scripture, are alien growths like barnacles. And uh, once the barnacles got so bad, uh, a couple of the sailors named Luther and Calvin said, we better go uh, overboard and scrape those barnacles off, return to the original ark them are trying to return. And I think that's the main reason the ecumenical movement has been so successful. Instead of moving forward, instead of progressing, instead of explaining and justifying our disagreements and arguing more and more, or worst of all, ignoring the issue, we want to return to our common origin, which is ultimately Christ himself. And that always works. It's not a, a magic formula but uh, it's the first principle of, of unity. That's where our unity lies. Our unity lies basically historically in the past not rather than in the future. Uh, in my own church, the Catholic church, there are two strong segments that I think are apparently opposite to each other, but they're making the same mistake in that they're not looking for that source of unity. One part, uh, the, let's say, to use political categories far right, says that uh, it all went wrong with Vatican II. Uh, Pre-Vatican II is right, post-Vatican II is wrong. Uh, and the other party, the, uh, the far left, the modernists say, no, pre-Vatican II was wrong and post-Vatican II is right. They're both wrong. Uh, that's usually the way arguments work. Uh, if we were, uh, I'll make just one little political statement here because this is kind of dangerous. My, my definition of politics is that it uh, comes from two words, poly, which means many, and ticks, which means annoying little bugs. But uh, I think if conservatives were really conservative and liberals were really liberal, uh, they'd come together. Because uh, in order to progress, in order to produce fruit, any organism needs to root itself in its roots that is tradition. And on the other hand, the whole point of the roots is not for their own sake, but for the sake of bearing fruits increasingly and, and progressing. So in principle, I think 
We need both. So let's start a third party. Uh, you might be thinking, he's a Catholic, many of us are Protestants. Can, can Catholics see the Protestant Reformation as something good and necessary and willed by God? And my answer is yes. Uh, I don't see how we can agree on issues that clearly divide us, for instance, uh, uh, the authority of the Pope or sola scriptura or how many sacraments there are. Uh, but uh, God is in charge of history. God frequently uses uh, others, outsiders, uh, often use parties that that are alien to each other and are fighting with each other to purify both of them. In God's providence, uh, nothing is accidental. And the Council of Trent certainly admitted that Luther and Calvin were fundamentally right about the need for very fundamental reforms in the church. On the other hand, can Protestants see Catholics as uh, anything other than simply idolaters or that are simply heretics wrong? And they see them as not just individually, but collectively a uh, 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 part of divine providence. Can they, can they learn something from Catholics? I wrote a book uh, with the title, Catholics and Protestants, What Can We Learn From Each Other? Uh, the title assumes that we can learn something from each other and that we should. And if we don't believe that at the beginning, if we think that... Uh, uh, listening is a waste of time, then we may as well just give up. All right, you uh, obviously detected that I'm rather optimistic about ecumenism. It may take quite a few centuries or millennia, but uh, I do believe that when Christ returns, he will not marry a harem. Uh, so how do we put together Humpty Dumpty who fell off the wall and broke into a thousand pieces or 30,000 pieces? And the answer, of course, is that we can't, but God can. But we can aid him. He uses us. He doesn't work against us. He's not a puppeteer. Uh, grace perfects and uses nature, including human reason and free will, finite and fallible as they are. Uh, so what do we do? Well, I'll give you seven answers. <laughs> seven. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> Dr. Kraft, I, I had to mute you briefly, but I'm attempting to unmute you. You may have to unmute yourself. Oh, hang on just a Am second. I, there you are. Yes, thank you so Am much. I now unmuted? Yes, thank you. My computer tells me I am muted and therefore I am unmuted. My, my, my computer is a liar. My question because our Lord does. Read John 17, his priestly prayer. Uh, one of the last things he asked his father before he knew his going off to crucifixion is that they may be one, even as we are one. Uh, most of us would say, well, that's a good thing. Uh, but that's not enough. You have, to, you have to shed tears. You have to bleed. It has to come from your heart. Second thing is hope. Hope as a theological virtue, not just optimism, not just a wish, uh, faith, hope, and charity are the three greatest things in the world, the three things that glue us to God. Uh, and our hope is not based on ourselves. Our hope is based on our Lord. Any other basis is vain. Uh, one of my favorite political jokes 
fact of history. Uh, back in the 1980s, I think, there was a, a Democratic senator from uh, Maine, Edmund Muskie, uh, who was a very sensitive guy, very nice guy. And he went to Iowa, where almost everybody's a Republican, and there was no platform for him to stand on. So he had to get up onto something high so that hundreds of people could see him. And the only thing he found was a manure spreader. So he climbed up on the manure spreader and he began his speech this way. He said, this is the first time in my life that I am making a democratic um, speech from a Republican platform. Uh, the joke could be told in reverse as well. The platform of our hope shouldn't be a manure spreader. We are manure spreaders. One of my favorite jokes of all time is uh, what Thomas Aquinas said. I believe Thomas Aquinas was probably the most intelligent the theologian and philosopher who ever lived. And his summa is a masterpiece, 4,000 pages of, of carefully and commonsensically reasoned argument. And it was unfinished. Uh, and the reason it was unfinished, uh, Thomas explained uh, to uh, his confessor, Brother Reginald, was that uh, uh, he had had a, uh, a vision, a mystical experience from God. And he said, in light of that vision, everything that I have ever written is nothing but straw. Now, you don't get the joke uh, unless you realize that in the Middle Ages, the main thing that straw was used for was to cover animal dung, especially from donkeys, horses, and bulls. So that's not a, a, a secure platform to stand on. But Christ is. Uh, the third thing we need. We need love. We need love of Christ who agonizes over his broken human body, and we need love of our fellow Christians uh, who are not thoroughly united with us. Love moves the world. And the fourth thing you need is truth. The, the two absolutely absolute absolutes are love and truth. Never, ever, ever compromise any one of them. And if you think you have to compromise one for the other, you're infallibly wrong. is true and God is love or to absolute and they often seem to contradict and they don't and when we assume that maybe they do and we take the side of one against the other we're in for a fall if on the other hand contrary to appearances we insist that they cannot possibly ever contradict because there is only one God and he is both then no matter how confused we are and how apparently unsuccessful we are, we're on the right path. So five th uh, four things so far, passion, hope, love, truth. This one is prayer. Uh, God often doesn't give us good things until we pray for them because he sees that the thing we need the most is to pray. Uh, ask and it shall be given to you, uh, but you have to ask in faith. If our faith were but more simple and we should take him at his word, and then miracles would happen. The sixth thing we need is fasting. Prayer and fasting always go together. And we don't do that much anymore. It's not just fasting from food, but fasting from all sorts of little comforts and innocent things and minor goods for the sake of greater good. It means sacrifice especially sacrifice our pride, sacrifice our self-confidence, sacrifice our comfort zones, take chances, trust the Lord, we're doing his work. And the final thing, of course, is humility. St. Augustine asked, what are the four cardinal virtues? Replied, humility, 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 and humility. If pride is the worst of sins, uh, humility is the first of virtues. Which means we have to listen to each other and learn from each other. We have to see what the other side sees. We have to get in their mind and understand them. And we also have to understand their reasons, their whys, their, their motives, their arguments. 
God himself says through his prophet Isaiah, come let us reason together. Reason is not just cleverness. Reason is not just computer logic. Reason is not just, uh, uh, well, let's sit down and compromise. Reason is the search for truth. I think we have reasons for hope. The first and most important one is that that's the will of Christ. We're not on our own. And the second is that both sides, all sides, increasingly see that. We have been returning to our common trunk, our common root, which is Christ himself. Both Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox are becoming more and more Christocentric. Not at the expense of anything else, but as the fulfillment of everything else. Uh, he is, after all, one Lord. And he's conducting this orchestra that we are. And the orchestra is playing uh, some pretty non-harmonious notes. Uh, and that can only be because we're staring at our own hands or our own instruments or our own piece of sheet music instead of staring at his baton. The more we look to his baton, the more we will come together because we know what his will is. It is unity. Just as pride and sin and selfishness motivated the disease, so the opposite will motivate the, the healing. And now the amazing good news, which quite most Christians still have not heard about, a miracle has already happened on the ecumenical front in the last 30 years or so. Uh, the most serious division among Christians is certainly between Catholics and Protestants, right? Ask any biblical Protestant, what's the fundamental issue of the Reformation? And they will say justification by faith. How do you get to heaven? Is it a, a, a one-part ticket or a two-part ticket? Is it faith plus good works or is it just faith? Uh, and the church in excommunicating Luther said explicitly, it's faith plus good works, you're wrong. And Luther and also Calvin and Zwingli and the other reformers said to the church, no, you're wrong. The Bible says it's just faith. Well, that seems like a non-negotiable issue. In fact, that's the most important issue of all. What must I do to be saved? What question could possibly be more important than that? And now the news. That Goliath is dead. That issue is solved. Uh, there's one Protestant writer, not sure who it was, uh, who said the Reformation is over. He later in the book admitted that's only a slight exaggeration. Uh, the worldwide organization of, of, of Lutheran bishop and the Vatican and a lot of other Protestants came on, some officially, some unofficially, uh, in three parts have uh, composed and published uh, a statement about justification, which has said that there is no substantive essential disagreement between our two churches on this issue. There's an apparent disagreement. There's a disagreement about minor issues. There's a disagreement about what language should be used. But substantively, we are not teaching opposite gospels. How does that happen? Well, it did. Without compromise, both sides said on the, the highest official level, we agree. Did they, did they come up with some clever formula or something? No, no. It just went back to our sources. What's our ultimate source? Scripture itself, right? Uh, what the scripture say? It says both. It says on the one hand that uh, uh, we are saved uh, by faith, not by the works of the law. On the other hand, the same scripture says faith without work, that is the works mandated by the law, uh, is dead. So are we saved by faith alone or by faith plus good works? Well, that depends on what you mean by saved. If you mean just getting to heaven, faith alone can save you. The uh, thief of the cross uh, was saved by a last minute of faith. It's unusual, but it happens. And if you mean fulfilling God's will and becoming a saint, that requires not just justification, but sanctification. 
and sanctification is not done without our free cooperation and willing. That is our faith and hope and love, not just faith. Uh, there are many parables of Christ that clearly make uh, our response to him in the form of the works of love uh, a condition of, uh, of our salvation. Not only is the word salvation ambiguous, the word faith is also ambiguous. In Romans and Galatians, Paul says faith alone saves you. He doesn't use the word alone, but he says faith saves you. Uh, on the other hand, the same Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that uh, there's something even greater than faith, love. Uh, and James says, do you have faith? in the one God. Oh, good for you. So does the devil. But he shakes with fear. So intellectual faith is not sufficient for salvation. Uh, the act of the mind prompted by the will by which we believe everything that God has revealed on the grounds of the authority of the God who revealed it, which is the old Baltimore Catechism definition of faith as the intellectual virtue that contributes to your salvation. Uh, that's not sufficient for salvation. The devil has it. He's not saved. On the other hand, if you, by faith, simply saying yes to Christ to come into your heart and save you, that'll save you. Yeah. It'll produce the work of love. But that act uh, in itself uh, saves you. And that's very simple. Uh, what I've said is an oversimplification, of course. There are all sorts of nuances to it, but but once you go to the sources with the mind of uh, a child ready to learn uh, and you don't throw one text against another as if you're playing ping pong, but try to put them all together uh, honestly and passionately, that's what you see. I remember at Calvin College back in the 1950s reading a very strange doctoral dissertation by a man with a funny name, uh, Hugo von Balthasar. Uh, and the doctoral dissertation was justification in Aquinas and Luther. And he argued that no contradiction between the two. Everybody thought he was a nut or a heretic. Uh, and he wasn't. He was a visionary. He was right. But notice how we did that. We, we didn't move forward, we moved backward. We thought our, our, our origin, our, our common root. Well, if we can do it that way, if, if, if we can take the biggest issue that divided the churches uh, in the worst uh, division, the most unfortunate and, and uh, further division producing division in history, if we, if we knock that Goliath down, then the rest of the Philistines are not going to stand very long either. It'll take a few centuries, but they're going to come down. Well, let's be very concrete. Uh, my last point is uh, I will give you four issues uh, to think about and to ask the question, can we, without compromise, uh, come to agreement on the essence of these four even though we haven't done so for 500 years. One of them is sola scriptura. Is infallible divine revelation confined to scripture or does it extend to the church's interpretations of scripture? It seems like an either or. And all of the Catholic dogmas that Catholics believe and Protestants don't uh, come from the principle that Catholics do not believe in sola scriptura. Uh, scripture was written by the church. If the church is not infallible, how could it produce an infallible scripture? Uh, and as a matter of fact, most Christians learn their doctrine uh, from other Christians, from tradition. Uh, on the other hand, scripture is clearly fallible. And the standard for the church, if the church departs from scripture in any way, you know that it's wrong. So how can each be a, a standard or judge of the other? That's, that's tricky. We haven't solved that one yet. Uh, in a sense, that's the, the main one because uh, Catholics don't 
become Catholics because they figure out each theological doctrine separately for themselves and say, isn't it funny the church is right about all these things? Well, I'll, I'll hop aboard. Rather, they look at the church and they say, well, the church is an institution that is not just human, but divine. Christ authorized it, Christ invented it, Christ gave his authority to the apostles and their successors. And therefore what the church teaches is true. Uh, I'll eat all the food that mother church puts on my plate. And Protestants reply, yeah, but the church is human as well as divine and it's made some mistakes. And uh, uh, unlike scripture, it's, uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and the argument goes on. How do you solve that one? Second doctrine is uh, what happens in the Eucharist. Is that really Christ? Or is that just a holy symbol? Is the consecrated host, the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, and should we adore it? Or when Catholics do that, are they committing the world's stupidest idolatry, confusing almighty God with bread and wine? Are we bowing down to bread? Are we worshiping wine? That's the issue that probably produced the most ire, the most wrath, the most uh, uncompromising refusals at the time of the Reformation, on both sides. That seems a, uh, an either or similar to uh, the either or about Christ. If he's not God, he's a, he's a very bad man. He's either a, a Lord, uh, he's either the Lord or a liar or a lunatic, nothing in between. Third issue is the church. Uh, one holy Catholic apostolic church. That sounds like the one visible Catholic church with all her dogmas and sacraments. Uh, if not, why not? What is the church? Uh, crucial. There's deep agreement. The church is the body of Christ. The church is holy. The church is the people of God. The church is Christ's church, not our church. Yeah, but is it infallible? And is it hierarchical? Sacramental? And does it issue dogmas and creeds? Uh, how can it do that uh, without being unified and without being visible? But on the other hand, the church looks pretty unholy most of the time, looks more like a whore than a bride. Uh, Catholics have to admit, the Catholic church is pretty good for producing spectacular saints, but also uh, equally good at producing spectacular sinners. Uh, finally, a fourth issue, which I think is a surprisingly easy issue to negotiate, but most Protestants don't think so, namely purgatory. When I became a Catholic, I shocked my parents. Uh, they were both good Dutch Calvinists. Uh, and I remember one argument I had with my father. Uh, it took a while, it took years. Uh, we finally reconciled uh, and with each other in agreeing to disagree. but. Uh, one of the arguments I was having with my father about purgatory was uh, listened to by my mother. My father was a, a, an elder in the church and a good amateur theologian, a, a very intelligent man, an engineer. My mother was just a very ordinary peasant -like lady. He was just listening. And uh, we argued for a long while and then we both got quiet. And uh, my mother said, John, my father's name was John. John, I think, you're saying pretty much the same thing we're saying in different words. And my father said, of course he's not. He says he's a Catholic and he believes in purgatory. We don't believe in that, we're Protestant. And Lucy said, well, Peter, let, let me see if I'm right. Uh, you, uh, you believe that, uh, that in heaven, there's nothing evil and nothing sinful. Uh, nothing sinful can enter heaven. That's right, right. Uh, and Peter, you believe that uh, right now on earth, we're all sinners. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yeah, that's true. Okay. okay. Now, there's a gap between sin and holiness, between light and darkness. That's in the Bible too. He said, that's right. So my mother turned to my father and says, well, we believe that too, don't we? So if, if we're sinners, here and we're going to be perfect saints in heaven then god's got to do something to us before we're fit for heaven now we don't know what it is or where it is or or how it works but and we don't call it purgatory but uh, 
aren't we just arguing about words? And my father, I, I still remember the look he gave. Uh, he was a good man. He was not by any means a male chauvinist. He loved and, and respected my mother, but he wasn't. He, he looked at her with, with a new eye and said, you know, you're probably right. Let's talk about something else. That reminds me, I'll just end with this anecdote. One relationship with my father that I had, I was about oh, 12 years old, I think, and uh, went to church in Sunday school, and learned all this stuff. Uh, and we were riding home from church one morning and uh, I was complaining that, I, that my teacher was confusing and that I didn't understand all this stuff. Uh, and my father was encouraging me and saying, well, when you get older, you'll understand it's a lot of milk. All we got to do is pray to Jesus and say, what do you want me to do? And then do it. And he looked at me and smiled and said, you know, son, you're absolutely right. And I think he's still smiling. Did I get unmuted again? No, again? no, you're absolutely with us. You're absolutely with us. We we fooled the digital demons. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you for that. Let's all give him a virtual applause. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Professor, Professor Craig, we have a lot of questions. Um, some questions are uh, some students who, uh, undergraduates who seem like, and some graduate students even, who who are asking to remain anonymous, I'll ask you those. Some I'll just call on the actual people. But let me begin with, with someone who's a bit anonymous. And here's the question. Um, so here it is. I'd like to ask you perhaps a rather personal question based on John Henry Newman's description of doctrine as, as evolving without change. In this season of your life, how have your ideas about ecumenism evolved? Well, I certainly agree with Newman. And like any growing thing, like any living thing, uh, doctrine can change without being false to itself. It can become more itself. Just as an adult oak tree is more of an oak tree than a little sapling. The sapling is closer to being a mature oak tree than it was as an acorn. So in very significant ways, what we understand and believe today about all these things, uh, the Trinity uh, is, a, is a prime example, is much more adequate, much more clear, much more complete than what the early Christians believed. Just as a 20-year-old is, is more developed than a two-year-old same person, the same body. So, Professor Crave, Professor Tusmalna, my dear spouse, Amanda, uh, uh, thank you so much. God bless everyone. Um, Professor Crave, thank you again, and God bless you. Same to you. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone.